All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Julie. I'm here with RJ Julia's, and we're really excited for tonight's guests. Um, starting off asking the hard hitting questions will be Gina Canapari. She is a freelance writer in Guilford, Connecticut. Her work has been published in Salon, Creative Nonfiction, and Off Assignment. And she's currently working on a memoir about grief, motherhood, and identity in an Italian immigrant family. And she will be in conversation with her very good friend, Lauren Gronstein. So this will be a very fun night. Um, Lauren is the author of five novels. Her stories, essays, and articles have appeared in various literary magazines and anthologies and have been translated into French, Turkish, German, Hebrew, and many other languages. Um, her most recent novel, We Must Not Think of Ourselves, is the Today Show's Read with Jenna Pick for December 2023. Uh, the Kirkus Review describes the book as a delicate, warm account of a brutal, cold time grounded in humanity, small details, and unwavering clarity. In addition to Kirkus, the founder of RJ Julia's Roxanne Cody is absolutely raving about this book. And while she cannot be here today, she did send along the following note. From page one, it is clear we are in the hands of a masterful storyteller. Her capacity to expose the brutality of the Warsaw Ghetto while preserving the humanity of its victims is one of the finest examples of novels about the Holocaust that I have read. And given her family's background, she has read dozens. Um, and there is a double dynamic. We understand the critical importance of preserving the minute details of the ghetto's prisoners, and we relish Lauren's ability to put us in the heart and mind of those preserving the truth. We Must Not Think of Ourselves is the most exquisite of novels, poignant, gripping, gripping, and enlightening. So please put your hands together for Lauren Gronstein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very nice. That's high praise indeed. <laughs> yeah, heard enough. I think that's it. Let's go. <laughs> I've, 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 not, I've no notes. I have no notes. Lauren, um, of course, I loved your book. I have so many questions. I've known Lauren a long time. 20, 27 seven years. years. 27 years since we're, we were in college. Since we were in grade school. Since we were in grade school. Grade school. Grade school. <laughs> yeah. We were so young. We are so young. So smart. So young. And I loved your book. And I'm going to just jump right into talking about your book. Okay, so much right, work. Um, I, I wanted to start. It's tough because I'm trying to think of a way to talk about this book without revealing. People, people are feeling like they're going to interrupt if they come in. Craig, just, oh, just sit. Craig, just sit. Craig, Craig just right out. These are my children. These are my kids. This is what happens when you're late. You have to sit in the We have to embarrass you. That's my, that's my son. These are both my sons. Hi. Hi. You're just in time. Just in time. Okay. okay. So I wanted to talk, to start with... Um, there's so much that I don't want to reveal to people who haven't read the book yet, because it really is something that, although we are all familiar with the history of the Warsaw Ghetto and the Holocaust, there's so much that unfolds in the book on a personal level between the characters. And what I just wanted to say about your writing from book to book is that that is your strength in, in really developing characters that we can cling on to as readers that have very real moments that we can connect to. And I thought that that was true of this book and like all your books. And I wanted to really start with the title of the book. Yeah. Why did you entitle the book, We Must Not Think of Ourselves? So a couple of reasons. So one, it's a line from the book. And I'm not yes. very good at titles. And you guys might not know that often you, authors do not get to pick their own title. And in fact, they're often, in fact, in, in my case, this is the first title I've ever I picked that was my own. Yes, yeah. I've, I've in the past. I remember emailing you like, yeah. "Here's two. Which one do you like?" Yeah, and yeah. you just have to yeah. feel it out. And, yeah, and so and often the publishing it's a marketing decision, which isn't yeah. how you want to think about your work, but it becomes a product. The product sells, and then they have to market it, and so the title becomes marketing. Um, and I'm not great at marketing, so I never picked great titles. So I am um, part of a small writing group, and I gave a couple idea, you know, a couple lines from the book to a friend. Uh, in that writing group, and she said, I like this one, we must not think of ourselves. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, first of all, it doesn't matter what I pick, they're definitely going to change it. And secondly, <laughs> right. I thought it was a call to Shiva, and that's the mm -hmm. important part. Shiva uh, her, you know, is the week of uh, mourning, the, the Jewish mourning period, uh, after someone dies, mm -hmm. and it's a week when traditionally you don't think of yourself, you think of the one that you've lost. And so that means you turn the books around, uh, the books, you turn the mirrors around, or you put cloth in front of them, you sit on hard surfaces, you're not supposed to be too comfortable, you're not supposed to think of yourself. So, of course, the people of the Warsaw ghetto who died had no one to sit for them. 
um, I cannot really do that, but I wanted to call that or recall that. So that's what the title means to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what it is. I found a lot actually in the title that really referred back to the book in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So just to back up about the book itself, the book mm -hmm. is about the Warsaw Ghetto, which was, I, I, I don't want to be the one that has to describe yeah. it. If you want to kind of give the background of this book. I mean, the thing you know, to know, so so I'll tell, this might go on, so just do that. I'm going to do the, to, just, okay, just, I'll just do start the talking manically if I go on too long. But so okay. in the book, there's a small sec, there's a small group of people who get together and they meet weekly and they all have notebooks in which they, they, they very studiously and in great detail describe the life of the people, the Jewish people in the Warsaw Ghetto who have been restricted by military force, by the Nazis to stay in a certain area where they're limited in supplies, they have no access to the outside world and they are just suffering it, as, as if they were, they're under siege essentially. Yeah. And so people in the ghetto feel that it's important to remember the stories of the Jewish people as they are being wiped out and so i think when i thought of the title we must not think of ourselves i think it's almost an ironic title because this is a moment in telling these stories before they disappear the jewish people must turn onto themselves and think of themselves and reflect on their lives and their culture so it's not lost so um it just really made me think that the way that they have to kind of get through this is to focus on their own grief before they, so it's got, it's almost ironic in that sense, that title, yeah. you know, and that they must not, and there's a sense of, they must not think of themselves as individuals yeah. with a community that, um, and it's a very kind of difficult balance, you know, in, in the book, Lauren tells the stories through interviews of various people in the community. So you hear through interview, the main character, Adam, transcribing the stories of different people that he knows in, in the ghetto. So you he's telling their stories and by telling their stories, he's telling the stories of the community. So I just thought that that was really kind of an important detail of the book. I'm talking so much. <laughs> I can keep going. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but you know, I want you to, you know, I just, I just thought um, how ironic that you know, they the the they have to practice this very selfless behavior while at the same time trying to turn in and save themselves. So yeah. the so the 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 people with the notebook that um the notebooks that Gina's referencing is a project called the Oneg Shabbat um project. It was started by a man named Emmanuel Ringelblum. This is all true. Emmanuel Ringelblum was an historian, he had studied in Switzerland. Um he found himself in Warsaw. Um, at the beginning of, uh, at, in, in November 1940, when the, the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed. One thing to note is that many Jewish people had no idea that the ghetto was going to be sealed. Mm -hmm. And another thing to note is that many people, even though their, their lives were slowly being taken apart piece mm -hmm. by piece by the new Nazi regime, it was impossible to understand exactly mm -hmm. where it was going to go. So writing this novel is sort of interesting because I was looking at... Um, a moment in time where I understood what was going to happen, but I had to embody people who didn't, right? Mm -hmm. So there was always that trying to recapture sort of the, the, the innocence of the world before Auschwitz, the world before Treblinka. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Ringelblum was one of the very few people who could see where this was going and knew because Warsaw had the second largest Jewish uh, community in the urban Jewish community in the world after New York at the time, that this was a really important moment for not just the Jews of Warsaw, but the Jews of history. Mm -hmm. He also knew, as every Jew, Jewish person did, that there have been Jews in Poland since about a thousand, the year 1000, mm -hmm. which means that mm -hmm. there were communities that were destroyed that were around for three times as long as this country. Mm -hmm. Communities that had lived and grown and passed down their stories for a thousand years that were just summarily wiped out. And he knew that if the Jewish people did not write down what was happening to them, that the Nazis would not only deny what happened, but would rewrite their story. Mm -hmm. So he gave 32 people that we know of notebooks, told them to write down everything. Mm -hmm. And they did. They wrote down newspaper. They took collected newspaper mm -hmm. articles. They did drawings. They wrote down. They took the first sort of um, sort mm -hmm. of scientific study of starvation in these in, mm -hmm. among children. 
because you would never do that kind of study unless you had to. Mm -hmm. um, in 1942, at a moment in July, at a moment called the Great Deportation, which was when they started taking 6,000 Jewish people a day out mm -hmm. of the ghetto to Treblinka, they buried the first tranche. In 1943, before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they buried mm -hmm. the rest. 2019, I was on a family trip to Warsaw mm -hmm. with, uh, for, to, in honor of my nephew's bar mitzvah. At the end of what had been a very arduous trip, I had an 11 year old with me and a three year old with me. So, uh, uh, and we were marching all over um, Poland, really seeing some really heavy stuff. Most of the group peeled off and went to see the soccer stadium. And I was like, God bless. But <laughs> I, being the oldest daughter, felt a need to press on. Mm -hmm. And uh, our last, last stop on our trip was this archive. Mm -hmm. And so you walk into this building and written on a wall in Polish, Hebrew, and English says what we've been unable to shout out to the world. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's, I don't know what that is. And then you walk up these stairs, and I have to tell you, I've been to this, this archive now three times. It's set up like a museum. There's never anyone there. Mm -hmm. There's like two or three people there. I mean, I, you walk up into this room, and you just see the story laid out for you. You mm -hmm. see the actual papers they collected. You see the rusted milk can in which they buried this archive. Mm -hmm. And so I left that day. I spent hours there, much longer than the tour guide expected us to stay, <laughs> and said, um, like everyone else was drinking at the hotel by the time I got back, and I, I said to my sister as we walked out, I was like, there are a thousand novels in that room, and mm -hmm. she said, well, you should write one of them. And I was like, no, yeah. no, that's too much. And that was the inspiration? That was the book. inspiration, yeah. And I just think it's incredible. I wanted to know a little bit more about your research process, mm -hmm. because you create these very vibrant characters that for me it's it they they stay with me and they're they're like ghosts the one um i'm i'm so sorry i'm gonna no, I'll do it. I'll tell you. the name of the yeah. woman who um is philip's mother yeah, mariam that is a particular character that just yeah. just she kind of is this this mother she's like the quintessential jewish mother mm -hmm. and she just sort of carries you through the book and reminds you of what's important about their stories and she almost like and she cooks and she cooks she finds food chicken and feet they, they found mean, scraps of food the kids yeah. the, the way they got food so the nazis stipulated only 250 calories a day more or less mm -hmm. which of course you can't survive on right so from the very beginning the gates were locked at two o'clock and they said i mean according to the records you started hearing the shots from the very out, first hour because uh, the guards started shooting people who were trying to get out mm -hmm. and the kids you needed little kids like like teddy or too big like you needed yeah. you five years ago yep. would have been assigned to mm -hmm. go through the tunnels or to go under the gates trade whatever their parents had smuggled in mm -hmm. and bring back the tunes and bring back right whatever chicken feet chicken feet back. yeah yeah, yeah. Was big, and, that was a moment in the book where chicken feet with yeah. luxury yeah, yeah yeah together with mariam this woman they yeah. make this dish to try to recreate what they had written before yeah. written before no but they eaten taken before and taken for eating, granted eating before yeah. and i think you do an incredible job with these sensory details in the book because the book shifts between the perspective of adam remembering his life before the war and then him telling the stories of these other other people and and through that combination of events these people start to understand what's happening to them and you kind of with them in real time get the sense that from the beginning they they face a lot of the characters say they can't possibly do this to us yeah. that would why it makes no sense why would they persecute us why would they do you know any why would they kill us why, why would they kill us? what is the benefit to them right. of doing it and the war gets revealed through their eyes throughout the whole book and you kind of get the sense along with them how just mind-boggling was to even conceive of it and and then it, how that ref i just it's tough because i don't want to give anything away but um how that reflects the choices they make throughout the book and so, what so inspires the research so the, to, like, so the research was i many writers that you speak to will say that they really like to do research because it's a great way of feeling like you're writing without writing it's so <laughs> I love you can it. write you yeah. feel very productive you feel like you've done all this stuff so but you also good. haven't had to yeah. do anything mm -hmm. that's that hard yeah so um i read a ton of books um yeah. the archive itself the onyx shabbat archive that i based the book yeah. on is online so yeah. you i recommend an hour or two of rabbit hole through that archive you find the most amazing stories there was a story of a girl i like to tell the story because it reminds me of my own daughter 
her mother gave her a zloty, a, a one coin, it's like a dollar, one precious zloty, and then told her that she could go buy whatever she wanted. And someone watching her watched her go up and down. If you've ever taken kids to the store, which I have, watch them try to figure out what to spend their precious dollars mm -hmm. on, right? And they and the person who's recording her is describing it in just that way. Mm -hmm. And finally, she decides she's going to get a cream filled bun, which is like mm -hmm. such a treasure. Another thing to note is that suppliers could come in. People just couldn't leave. So mm -hmm. if you could pay your suppliers, and some people still could, there were people who had money somehow mm -hmm. into the ghetto. There were cafes. There were bakeries. Mm -hmm. It's just that you couldn't buy anything there and if you didn't have money, and most people didn't. Anyway, this girl has her as well. She goes, she buys a cream bun. She's about to take a bite and a, a starving kid comes and grabs it and mm -hmm. eats it, jams mm -hmm. it. And then a crowd comes and attacks the starving kid. And it's just like this cycle of desperation and sadness. And I read, but I read the first four fifths of that story and I was like, oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. And then you read the devastating end. Mm -hmm. So, so much of the research was like that, where it was like, oh, someone's doing laundry. Oh, someone's cooking a meal. Oh, I recognize myself in this. I recognize my kids in this. I recognize my parents in this. Oh, there's a devastating thing. And then yeah. some of it is just really boring, like, right. which is good. Like right. some of it is just people recording, living their lives and just trying to get through the day and mm -hmm. doing some work. And, and, and I found myself, I found such respite and the boredom mm -hmm. because when I was reading, because I didn't want to come across the sadness that I knew was going to mm -hmm. happen. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because you want to, you know, a lot of what you're, uh, you know, when you're writing, you know, you're taught to sort of make the stories that you're trying to tell universal and really something that um, everyone can find a piece of themselves in. And I had a teacher, one of my teachers from my program now is like, why? What is, what is this emphasis on making everything universal? And I felt like this was a sort of an instance where I wanted, I, 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 I it wasn't about finding myself in this book. It was, it was putting, and it wasn't about relating to this book for me. It was about putting myself in the shoes of other people and trying to understand that maybe there's something universal in what I might gain from that. But the particularness of this story, the particularity, is that a word? The particularity of the story <laughs> um, is really what's important here. The, the, the details, the feelings that they have that, 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 we must remember our singular experiences for that for, to, to really kind of underscore their importance in our history. And that kind of brings me to another question. Um, I, I, you know, that's such an important theme in this book is, is what it means to be Jewish. And especially now, and I, I, I've obviously, I'm a goy, obviously. <laughs> but I, there was a quote in this book that I just really struck me. I, I you know, I'm a, I'm from New York. I'm from Long Island. I know a lot of Jewish people. They're That's part true. of my. They're yeah. in my heart. And um, there's a quote about the 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 main character, and he has a brother, Simone Shimon, yeah. that decided to move to what was called Palestine then. Yeah, and, and he was uh, he was um, Shimon, Shimon in Polish, mm -hmm. and then he changed it to Shimon. So it was S Z I M O N, and yeah. then in Israel it became S H I M O N. Yeah, and right, and I'm, and um, so he makes that decision, and so Adam says, since we were boys, Jimon now Shimon, um, had felt more attuned to his Judaism, or perhaps more put out by it, um, which was almost the same feeling. So I wanted, I wanted to get your your thoughts. That comment really struck me, um, as that's a deep part of what what the experience is that you've got to take in all of the amazing things about the culture and the religion of being Jewish and all of the history as well and it it is it, something that these events as we were saying are recent events and they are, affect the outlook like generational trauma of recent generation you know of people going forward so what did that comment mean to you? You know, what is what does it mean? So, I mean, I think you were talking, you know, it's funny. I've done a bunch of interviews and people sort of want to talk about what's happening now, but also yeah. worried about, which I understand completely, but I'm right. happy with to talk about it right now with understanding that I know what I know and not more and that, and under the huge umbrella of all I want, because I'm a decent person, so it's everyone in this room is like, I want peace, I want peace, I want anyone, I want children to suffer. Um, the events of this book are only 80 years old. That means that between in our parents' lifetime, our grandparents' lifetime, these these things happened. Mm -hmm. People were rounded up, starved, killed, 
you know, shot in the streets or then shipped to camps where the majority of them are coming. Um, what is happening now, not in Israel, not in Gaza, which I, I, again, all I feel equipped to say is that it is horrific on all sides. But what's happening in the United States, so there's a, a, a um, I'm from near Philadelphia. There's a, a famous restaurant there called Zahav. The guy is really very good if you should ever find yourself there. It's Israeli. And he, the guy who owns it also, he's part Israeli. He lost his brother. He donates a lot of money to charities in Israel. He's also features a lot of Palestinian chefs. I, you know, I don't know him, but there was a huge rally uh, protest in front of his very, very good falafel shop yesterday mm -hmm. where uh, anti-Semitic things were yelled at him. And then there's, it, there's falafel shops next to a Jewish preschool that was vandalized. Mm -hmm. My sister's uh, synagogue in Marshall Island was vandalized. Um, my students at Rutgers, I'm a professor at Rutgers, uh, one of them came up to me and says, I just don't want to wear my Jewish star anymore. Another one didn't want her roommates to know she was Jewish. So this is just happening. Um, I have found myself thinking I have one child who looks theoretically could be Jewish and one child who is adopted from China, so does not look stereotypically Jewish. Um, and I found myself thinking, well, at least one of them, like just, just casually thinking, well, at least one of them's okay. One of them's mm -hmm. same, right? Which is not a thought that I ever expected to have in my lifetime, even though my grandparents, who lost cousins in the Holocaust, and my grandmother were very clear, like, oh, it could happen again. And you're just like, grandma, don't worry. Mm -hmm. You know, right. or your parents, who grew up between these generations, just, uh, just wanted to make sure you knew, mm -hmm. right? Without trying to put too much of a burden on you, that you knew that 30 years before you were born, in my case, mm -hmm. 31 years before I was born, World War II ended. So mm -hmm. that's not fair. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism, I think, is very um, appealing to people. It's got a sort of cult, uh, conspiracy-like quality that I think people like. I think that many people are uh, curious why why do Jews seem so successful? You know, they must be doing something. Mm -hmm. Even many many Jews, of course, are not, and many many Jews mm -hmm. struggle. But Jews, being people, have the same problems that people have. Right? Um, but I think that anti-Semitism has long been appealing to people for all sorts of reasons mm -hmm. and conspiratoriality and being able to join a community of like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And now you can feel like you're on the right side, that you're standing up for Palestinians somehow mm -hmm. by attacking Jews, which of course is wrongheaded. And as someone who also stands up for Palestinians knows mm -hmm. that the best way to do that is to stand up for Palestinians and not attack Jewish mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, it's very scary for me personally at this moment. I um have thought about where the passports are i'm not a drama dramatic person i don't I'll, i'm a little dramatic but like i'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not i don't think of myself particularly i'm not yeah. you know but i just thought to myself well you know mm -hmm. who are the friends who would hide us who where would we go mm -hmm. part of that is because you grow up with these stories so it's just knee jerk to think about them now and part of it is because when 10 miles away from you they're painting swastikas on the daycare center that your kids would have gone to had you lived 10 miles from here, mm -hmm. you start to think about what happens next. If this story teaches you anything, it's that it's an escalation. Mm -hmm. And it's not just anti-Semitism, obviously, right? That that any kind of hatred of a, a, a group can lead to escalating violence. And we've seen this again and again across all sorts of different communities. But for Jews, it is a very, very profound thing. There is no Jewish person you know who was not converted, but any Jewish person you know who's born Jewish is related to someone who was killed because he or she was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Period. That's just so mm -hmm. that's that's a heavy thing to live with. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't um it's it's not something I've found easy to to put aside mm -hmm. in the way that I managed to put all sorts of other things aside. Like should I have that other second bowl of ice cream? I don't know. I'm not gonna think about it. You know? Right. Did my kid feel French? I don't know. I'm not gonna think about it. But um, where the passports are, I'm going to think about it. Right. And that's that's been newly terrifying. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's it's a part of you, you know. Right. And even, sure that, that is, yeah. even in other times, even times not as dire as this, it is just right. a part of your life. Right. And, and this is a very, it's a very long history. It's not right. like this just, it didn't start with the Holocaust. No, no, no. Yeah. You know, I mean, right. it's as old as these communities of, right. of people. Right, the reason, so Poland... Yeah. The, the word Poland, mm -hmm. it's it's 
this is probably apocryphal, but holy in any room means place of rest. Mm -hmm. And so what the story is, and again, it's probably not true, but that the Jews who'd been, who, this part is true, where the Jews had been kicked out of Western Europe, where many of them had been allowed to live on the outsides of cities mm -hmm. and had made their money. They were allowed to, uh, you know, do trade or they were, allowed, they were allowed to do very specific jobs. So sometimes they could charge interest so they could be in banking, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, then there would be some kind of pogrom or some kind of, you know, uprising and the Jews were kicked out. Mm -hmm. And so this began happening a lot around the year 800, 900 out of Western Europe. And the Jews began a pilgrimage to Poland and they got to the forest of Poland and they thought, Poland, this is a place of rest. And mm -hmm. they rested there and they made Poland their own. Mm -hmm. Something that I think is really interesting. And I cannot remember if I'm answering that question right now. So I'm just going to roll with it. Just go for just it. Going for it. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I think is is quite interesting is that we have this idea, I grew up with this idea of Poland as a sort of monolithic white Catholic mm -hmm. country. Every Polish person I've ever met has been Catholic and blonde and very beautiful and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, before the war, Poland was very multicultural. There were Ukrainians, there were Germans, there were Lithuanians, there were, you know, many, many Jewish people, that there had been trade um, uh, going up to a city that was then called Danzig, which was free city of Danzig but on the Polish border. The Hanseatic League. Correct look at that and so right so so there were people going Poland was a crossroads it still mm -hmm. is yeah. but communism sort of cut it out. Anyway what I didn't realize was just how profoundly sophisticated and cosmopolitan Polish people especially urban Polish people were. They often spoke multiple languages. Mm -hmm. They traded with multiple people and all of that was just extinguished mm -hmm. so that now Poland is now it is mostly a white Catholic country mm -hmm. and this idea that any country has to be a monolith yeah. has to be yeah. Yeah. homogeneous be is so false because yeah. it's just people just crossing paths right. and and for better for good reasons and for bad right. that the land has these layers of people on it and right. together they make this place right exactly and it happens all over the world right. you know and it's I mean, I was thinking about doing a, like I those land acknowledgments that are so, yeah. you know, in style right now. Yeah. And I decided that, but it's like, it's just this idea, you know, it seems kind of a false thing to do. But yeah. the idea that people can belong to land is very complicated. And it's just ironic that in in creating a ghetto, you know, you are you are just cementing people to a particular sure. plot of land, yeah. which is just and then and then destroying it it's just it's terrible and um yeah i just thought um that you just did a such a great job um bringing all of this to life and the thing to point out yeah so, and this might surprise you is that there are parts that are funny <laughs> there was a part that was it's funny not all I, I, miserable it has a light there's a light there's a funniness there's a, the, i remember one part where they were talking about something really serious in their group and the one good thing about being in this oneg shabbat group is that you got food yeah and so the the main character was clearly like very interested in coming for the, the dried apricots and they were talking about something really heavy like i think that the nazis had just invaded russia yeah. so they're like oh my god <laughs> the nazis invaded russia and like and then the guy's like it would really be nice to have an apricot right now <laughs> <laughs> really, this news just would go down better with apricots you could just pass that around one more time yeah and they're like having this but it's yeah. like it's well, just we've all been in that meeting oh yeah it's yeah, like what would make this meeting better was it would be some food a donut be, yeah like a tiny uh, quiche yeah just a little quiche. a little, a little oh, one like a white man's quiche like a little petite quiche. just a quiche yeah one quiche and and that's just it's just such this weaving of these huge historical events and huge changes with this everyday life yeah. that you do so well in the book and and um, that's how we're living now right that's how we're it's just like you you know you're you're in the kitchen chopping onions yeah. and then you find out you know something hideous yeah, like, happened yeah. with donald trump you know it's just it's just the way of the like, great awesome yeah. you know and you're yeah. just and and even that's though actually what i was doing on january 6th yeah I like i like my husband came in and he was yeah. like I, I think i'd go out that night so i was making something mm -hmm. i don't know and i'm like chopping food and he's yeah. like well this is what just happened i'm like huh <laughs> and that's the scary thing about it. it's like things terrible things happen and you still have to sit in the kitchen and chop oh, your yes. chop your onions or carrots or whatever yeah. and it's that's not going to change until things get, I mean, right. it's, it, it, this is just a, such a singular event. Um, 
And I think you just do a great job of, of bringing this humanity, of bringing a little bit of lightness to it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I am needing to do, because I just don't know how you get through life without doing it, and mm-hmm. just maybe like, a little bit of hope. Mm-hmm. There had to be a little bit of hope. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't read a novel, I think, without a little bit of hope. I can't get up out of bed without a little bit right. of hope. So I really needed to just give all these people a little bit of hope. That you and you did, and it's tough because I don't want to give anything That's away. Give it away. Give anything away. There are characters in the book that you root for, and you want to see these. You want to see good things happen to them, and you want them to be together, or you want them to understand each other in a certain way. And but there's a there's a there's a part in the book where the main character sort of he gives something away, and he has a moment where he says, "I just did this. I have no hope." And he felt a lightning because he just knew at that moment, I can't give him away, that that everything fell completely out of his hands. Completely. I mean, to the point, you know, that he had no leverage, no, no home, nothing to turn to. And then he was just like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a big, scary kind of liberation. That, but that's a very complicated, it's a complicated feeling. And there are so many complicated feelings in this book that I think is what makes it strong is that it's not all um, it's not all tragedy or comedy. And I do think it's interesting. This is, this book is told only from the perspective of Jewish people. And you have these Nazi characters that figure into the book. We don't hear their voices. And I think that's, of course, that's appropriate. And it's just interesting that there's this whole other side that you just end up wondering what on earth motivated them to do these sorts of things what to these thinking? individuals in the book. You know, there's a character of a young woman um, whose name, I, I'm Shifra. Shifra. Yeah. And, and when I was picturing, she's a young, pretty woman. And I just kept picturing her as the actress, Julia Garner from Ozark. Sure. And that's who I pictured. Sure, we can have that. Yeah. That's who I pictured. Yeah. But she, she has a very sort of distinct way she goes about trying to save her family and she kind of comes in she she puts herself in contact with a lot of 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 people on the other side and it just makes you wonder what are these people thinking why why do they do this to her because all this grief we have is universal it's also her story alone you make that comment in the book is grief happens to all of us at an individual level but combine it's just it combines to make it's just tragic um so i know that we're supposed to do some q and a i don't know Q&A. what the timing is with this i i think it's q and a time it's Q&A. It like q and a time do you guys have any questions do you have any questions and i actually can answer, i mean or just keep talking i well there are a couple things that people often want to know that yeah. I, have, I just but then they don't know if they should ask but like if you want to know about the writing process, the publishing process, or mm-hmm. the the Jenna Bush Hager process. I'd have to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a big one. Um yeah. Yeah. So my question is about the archive. Um, yeah. the this the people that were the subjects of the observation, were they ever is there any indication in the archive that they were aware that they oh, were yeah, sure. they, they were often participants in they were participants. interviews or <laughs> they would contribute material. So there was one, um, there were many artists, obviously, right? And you know, and they would say perhaps you'd want this drawing or you'd want um, so so it was it was secret in the sense that the Nazis couldn't know. Yeah. Um, although I can't imagine if they did know what would be what worse, what punishment could they possibly yeah. give that was worse than what they were already doing. But it was a secret archive, uh, but many, and not everyone knew that they were being observed and not everybody knew that they were being written about, but many people did. Yeah, yeah and in the book, it's interesting because the characters that Adam interviews, he's sitting down intentionally to interview them and they ask him, why do you want to know my story? Yeah. You know, so they're very it's sort of con- they're very conscious of you know trying to place themselves yeah, well, in, in the like story. People, so what? Yeah, what, what, what and children, they're children. Yeah. I think I was very compelled, like, by your use of children in the book yeah. and the way that they they have to struggle with this. And you want to say that they have to be adults, but it's not true. They still have. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like, chill. I feel like children are just a very important part of this yeah. book yeah, yeah, yeah. and how did you kind of come to put yourself in a, in a frame of mind to write 
so closely to children's experience. I think that could be hard for writers to write about children. No, I agree. Um, so the secret to writing children is that you make them, if you think you're writing about a seven-year-old, imagine a one-year-old. If you think mm -hmm. you're writing, these children are much, much smarter than adults remember. They know a lot more. They're more sophisticated. They are very, very observant. Mm -hmm. And I think that adults love to underestimate kids and underestimate what they know, or they love to think that kids are like one thing, like kids are just cute or kids are just annoying, or, but kids are everything because they're people. So mm -hmm. I think the way that I write children is to remember that mm -hmm. and that guided me throughout all of these and the other thing is like well what would a kid think right now kids mm -hmm. understand their powerlessness they don't expect to be in control of their family's decisions so in some way it's like oh i guess here's another crazy thing mom and dad are doing you know mm -hmm. but without really feeling like they that that they had any agency in the first place mm -hmm. to be taken away yeah mm -hmm. so i love like in holocaust non uh, fiction how you started with the main character feeling himself as lucky yeah. um, because of his circumstances. Yeah. And this is really at the very end. Yeah, yeah, no spoiler. This yeah. is no spoiler, but mm -hmm. um, his wife couldn't conceive. And mm -hmm. then they also, she passed away like very early on in the book. So she didn't experience any of the horrors to come. So he keeps pointing out that in a way it's lucky that we don't have children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was a unique, like, unusual like hopeful vision of yeah. their circumstance yeah my two two questions was how was that based on a particular person that you read yeah. and then my other question is was that poetry that you liked that yes. you incorporated or did you have to be more selective or in tune to what was going on uh I picked poems that I like for the most part one or two, like uh, the, the If poem by Rudyard Kipling that all the kids are like, oh, yeah. this stinks. So I was like, yeah. The, but, the, the main character teaches English yeah, to he's, children. And, and, and yeah. because he can't, he, he's memorized a lot of poems in his life. Yeah. He doesn't have any books, so he just teaches them the poems he remembers. Um, and then Adam, the main character. So so because I knew, knew this book had to have feel hopeful, there's no, who would want to read, who would want to write a book that was just full of despair the whole time? So I made him an optimist who was able to see even in these tragic circumstances the luck in his life so he says you know i know where my wife is buried that is luck mm -hmm. i know i can find her gravestone that is luck he never had kids so i don't have to he looks at all the mothers around him He's, he doesn't have to worry about his own children he um you know he he feels bless you he just he he feels like in these circumstances which are so hard for other people he is better positioned and so he knows that he's lucky and that luck i think really fortifies him throughout the book yes me yeah oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. um I, I have a just a few questions yeah. and so um this is obviously a novel but it's based on you know on historical facts and yes. these archives so are the people in the book are they all fictional uh -huh. but kind of a conglomeration of things you've gathered in your research so some real people make very short, like sort of cameo appearances, including Emmanuel Ringelblum and a few of the archivists. Um, I did a brief concert by Vladislav Spillman, who was the pianist, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto, who was in the movie, because um, mm -hmm. I thought that would be fun. Yeah. Um, but the characters all have names that actually came. They, their first names and their last names don't match, but all the names came from victims. So. There were Shifras and there were Adams and there were Paskovs and there were those and there were Leshkovichs and Mariam. So, so all of those names were a way of trying to. Yeah. Um, and then as far as, as their characterizations, no, that was invented. Okay. Part. Second part of the question. Yeah. How do they find these archives? Like, any That's such a good question. And, yeah. and the third thing will be, yeah. did anyone survive who? Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is how they found them. So that we know of 32, there might have been more. There probably were more. 32 archivists. And you can find out all about them if you go to the archive, either the website or at, in, in Warsaw, 35 Tomaskia Street, uh, which is where they actually met. And it's where the archive is now. Um, of the 32, we know three survived. One was a woman named Rahela Auerbach. She later testified um, in the Eichmann trial. Um, and then two were a married couple, uh, the Vossers. They remembered where two of the three tranches were buried. So in 1946, they dug up the first one and there are pictures of them digging it up and like sobbing, you know. And then in 1950, they found the other one. There's a third milk can that they say is under the Chinese embassy. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Nobody knows. Um, Emmanuel Ringelblum himself survived the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, but he and his young son and wife were um, found hiding somewhere and were shot. Um, 
most of many of the uh, the people uh, in the ghetto were sent to Treblinka. Some who managed to escape, uh, some did live, very few, but some did. Some who um, were put in hiding were were found or turned in. Um, and, uh, you know, the people who survived um, would sometimes go back home to Poland and be killed there mm -hmm. because people had taken their homes and didn't want them to come. So it was an incredibly tragic period for everyone. Um, but you can meet, even today, I think there are still a few survivors of the worst like everyone. Mm -hmm. But but very, very, very. I have another question. Please. <laughs> um, these are all very good questions, by the way. I just made me think of another one. Um, one part of the story I thought was interesting is that Adam has lost his wife. She was not Jewish. Yes. And I just wondered, and she was Polish, and she comes from a sort of well-off family, and that's a major part of the story. Right. Why did you choose um, to have his his late wife come from the Polish community? So, so the only way the book would work. Okay. So, so sometimes you make decisions when you're writing a, a novel that are just like, like people have asked me, like, why did you make him not observant? Well, if he had been observant, he would have married a Catholic. If he hadn't married a Catholic, he wouldn't have had the tools he needed to get through this period. So, in order to make the plot work, I had to make certain choices. And mm -hmm. so the first choice was that he couldn't be that observant himself. Mm -hmm. And the second choice would be that um, he didn't have a family with him. And the third choice would be that he had been connected to a Polish, a wealthy Polish family. Mm -hmm. If he'd been connected to a wealthy Jewish family, it wouldn't have helped. <laughs> the other thing to know just, is that in Germany, it was very, very common for Jew many Jews who risen to the very heights of arts, culture, politics, media everything you know in poland it was much less common in, in poland most jewish people stayed in their own community so it was more rare mm -hmm. to be an assimilated jewish person like mm -hmm. him and i was worried about the accuracy of that but when i went back to warsaw i saw this quote on the wall from of a, a, a jewish museum in, in warsaw um, a man who's called himself a jew pole i am a jew pole mm -hmm. and i feel firmly jewish and firmly polish in every cell of my body mm -hmm. and i thought well that is delightful because i am a jew american and I feel mm -hmm. firmly Jewish and firmly American in every cell of my body. Mm -hmm. um, and so that happened then. And it's, uh, you know, it's 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 who he was. He was mm -hmm. very attached to being, he was comfortable in Polish society. And he was very, he was more comfortable actually being Polish than he was being Jewish. Mm -hmm. Also, that's another thing that people ask. Like, what do you mean? Polish versus Jewish? Weren't they Polish Jews? Not often. Often <laughs> you call Jewish people Jewish mm -hmm. and non-Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Even if you lived in Poland for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. True in many countries. Right. In both exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember in, in my, Europe. Yeah. My mother's family is from um some of her family is from Lithuania. And I remember we had like internet, we were all heritage day or something. We we're all supposed to like dress up like our heritage. And so I was gonna like make a flower crown from Lithuania because I yeah. lived in an encyclopedia. <laughs> and uh my mother's yeah. like, what is that? I was like, because we're Lithuanian. She's like, we are not. We're <laughs> Jewish. I was like, right, from Lithuania. She's like, no, no, no. No flower crap for you. I'm like, but it's okay. <laughs> no, no. For you, this bagel. <laughs> Just walk around for the bagel. It's fine. Well, it's, it's true. Some of the uh, Russian Jews who emigrated said they never knew they were Russian until they mm -hmm. came to this country. Yeah, sure. And people call them Russian, but and they were Russian. Right. right. And, and and the whole strip of land called the Pale of Settlement, you know the phrase Bach, beyond the pale, yeah. it's the Pale of Settlement, which mm -hmm. I just found out recently. Um, and the Pale of Settlement was like a strip of land that where most of the Jews you know come from. So it's like Odessa and Warsaw and Minsk and, you know, it's, it's the places, not Moscow, because the Russians didn't want Jews in the capital city, mm -hmm. and not Vienna, although there were, but those were different, those were like wealthy, mm -hmm. successful, sophisticated Jews. The Jews who emigrated here, especially in the big, great wave of emigration in the 1910s and 20s, tended to come from the Pale of Settlement because it just became too awful there, mm -hmm. um, whereas the Jews in Vienna often stayed, mm -hmm. you know, until much later, because it wasn't awful for them there. So most of, that's why most American Jews that you know have roots in the Palestine. Yeah, uh, and it's not that, that they their culture does. Is, their culture was not from those countries. Not from those all. countries. No, 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 you know, no. and they split in the book. It's interesting. You use like you're 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 looking at a polyglot community yes. in the ghetto, yes. and it was I thought it was really nice how you used you used. The, the the Jews in the book are speaking Yiddish to each other essentially, yes. and then they're learning English yes. from Adam, the main who also speaks German, who also speaks German Polish. and Polish. Yes. But he is 
he is communicating with his housemates that he lives with in Yiddish. And that's a that's a that's a language that yeah. crosses borders right. that belongs to the, the Jewish yes. community. Exactly. Not the Jewish community. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. one more question. Oh, we got one more one more? Yeah. You touched on it. Um how did your book get selected? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the lighting that got um so lots and lots of books get submitted my agent a literary agent and she has had some good luck uh this is she's had three or four books selected over the years jenna's been doing this book club for five years um which yeah she um i think got her niche in the today show by writing herself her mother was a librarian um she does read the books they select I don't think she, she there's no way she could possibly read all the books they submit and I've met now some of the people on her team who do sort of some vetting but by the time it gets up the chain she actually does read them uh, I found out in February which was almost a year ago I was told to not tell a soul and although usually I'm a sieve I'm not going to say just I mean tell me anything you want but I'm not going to keep saying but um <laughs> but I told my husband because I was allowed to do that and then I just had to sit on it. I couldn't tell my assistant. I couldn't tell Gina. I couldn't tell anyone. You tell your parents? No, I couldn't tell anyone. You could probably tell my father. <laughs> You'll love an I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, the whole, yeah. Every little, all of Bergen County, you know. No. So I tell no one. And then he'd be like, what? 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 He'd get mad that I was mad. It would be a whole thing. So I, um, um, so I couldn't tell a soul. And then on Monday, a week ago, yesterday, she does this announcement. And, um, it was the most surreal. First of all, to see people jumping up, to see people like she, they hand out copies and they do this announcement on the day show. So people are holding up this very intense book about the Holocaust, like jumping up. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, um, you know, and then I did the taping yesterday and um, it was just, I, I, it was really nice. Like the people were wildly nice. And of course, like they're not there to like trip me up and welcoming <laughs> and um you know did you get your makeup done is that part of it i got some makeup <laughs> i got i got i always wonder the, the woman doing my hair was like she's like do you, do you want a facelift i was like of course and she's like here we go and so she just i have to do it like like do you want a facelift i was like yeah she's like ah and so i have this really high ponytail but i it, it is good it does not work that's like the bonus tip like, from this book new york hair dresser tip for you guys so, so, I mean, I am sitting like this and it just hurt. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was, it was just unbelievable. And the nicest part was that I got to take, my son is 15 and I got to take him and um, he, it was the first time in a very long time that he was not too cool for something, you know, oh, and they had me okay. sign like the board where everyone, and they're like, just sign here. And so it's like, like um, Aquafina and Natalie Portman and me. Uh, <laughs> and, and Nate, my son was like, that's, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I was like, thank you. That's mid. Me. Thank that's you. mid. And then, and, then, and then to celebrate, I have to take him shopping. So, so. No, um, no cap. No cap. He, no, he was, he was, he was psyched. I was, I was beyond. I was just like not. I expected to be nervous. I was so, I was not even, I was so, it was so beyond. I was just like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just going to talk to these like, nice ladies. Hold with up. a lot of makeup, Hoda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the middle of that, I was like, "Can we be friends or something?" And I was like, "I was like, oh, of course, Hoda. You don't you need to be friends. Yes. Okay, maybe. Okay, sure. Let's find out. Then right. I can follow. We can all <laughs> be friends. Aww. Um. So yeah. Thank you. It's great. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.